Hello, my name is Randy Chessel and I'm the speaker for today's presentation um, on a project called ODPI Algeria. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at how um, the technology um, provided by ODPI Algeria helps organisations become more integrated and better governed. Uh, so let's start with an example um, of the type of uh, problem that we're trying to solve here. So for many um, organisations, particularly those in regulated industries, um, they find it very helpful to capture the vocabulary that they use in the business um, and the data that um, is associated with it. So what do we mean by vocabulary? We mean uh, the words that are used to talk about what's going on in, in the business, so su such as customer and uh, customer order and invoice. So all of the terminology um, we, uh, you know, if, if we can understand exactly what that means and how these terms relate, then we um, understand the language of the business. And typically that language has uh, data associated with it. So, for example, if you are supporting customers, then you often keep records about customers and you associate those that information with particular orders that they're making or invoices that they're paying for. So. That vocabulary gives you a very clear idea of the type of data that you're going to be working with. Now, um, because this is written in the language of the business, experts from the business can attach um, extra knowledge about how data of that type should be managed. So, for example, it might be that uh, when we look at uh, credit card information, that's um, there's a certain set of regulations around managing that type of data and, um, and, and, and definitions about what can be stored and what has to be um, gathered from the, uh, uh, the credit card owner each time they make a purchase, for example. So we can attach the rules um, and regulations and classifications of um, particular types of data to that vocabulary. Um, and there's certain advantages to that. It creates a conversation in the business about how data should be managed. And that helps the IT team in terms of uh, capturing requirements around the way that they have to manage data. But we can do so much more um, once we have this encoding of um, a particular um, business's vocabulary. Now, think of a developer working on building a new application. And so they're probably going to build an API. Maybe they're going to build a database with a particular schema structure. From the vocabulary, we can generate um, uh, schema structures. So this is basically a description of how the fields, uh, what type of fields and uh, sort of how they're arranged. Um, and we, we can actually build that from the vocabulary. And if that's integrated into the developer's tool, you imagine them creating an API called Create Customer, for example. Um, if they can set from their tool, if they can say, give me the schema for um, a customer, um, then uh, and, and sort of and that's um, embedded into their new API. Uh, this gives them tremendous advantage. Firstly, they haven't had to type all those fields in and there could be quite a lot. Um, but secondly, they, they are sure that they've got it right um, because it's, it's come from the vocabulary. Um, and so they're happier, they reduce their rework and their work is much faster. Um, now imagine that they've, they've built their API um, and they've built a, a database to sit behind it. Um, and it's all finished and tested and it's now moving into the DevOps pipeline to go through the final set of testing in order to bring it into production. Now, because it's been built with schemas that have been derived from the vocabulary, um, these schemas actually can have markers in them that um, can then be read by any subsequent processing. So as that uh, piece of uh, new system, this new service comes, uh, goes through the DevOps pipeline, then um, it can, the DevOps, the logic in the DevOps pipeline can look at these markers and say, well, wait a minute, there's sensitive personal data that's going through this particular application. We need to do some extra testing. The, uh, the whole uh, service now needs to be put onto a, um, a, a you know, particular secured gateway and the database needs to be encrypted. So all those rules about how the, uh, the new service has to be deployed can be um, enacted by the DevOps pipeline because it can see what type of data is being supported by that particular service. So we've 
by linking these tools together, we have uh, sp uh, speeded up the process of building the new server so the developers working faster and the DevOps pipeline is able to ensure proper um, deployment of the service into production. Now, think, now time passes and um, the application is running very successfully. It is uh, generating interesting data and the business thinks, well, we can probably serve our customers better if we know a little bit more about them. So data scientist is uh, commissioned to do some analysis on the customer data to see if there are any trends or um, different types of insight that they can get from that, um, from that application's data. Now, of course, within that data, there's obviously interesting things to look at, but there's also uh, personal data that is really probably of no interest or um, you know, to this particular type of analysis. And because that application came from a sort of marked up schema um, and is cataloged as a, process, as a part of the DevOps pipeline delivery, it's very easy for the data scientist to locate where the data is. The catalog tells them exactly what's in that data. So they're not having to sort of ask people or try to guess uh, what's in the data. But also, as a copy of that data is brought into the data science tool so that they can experiment with it, additional governance rules, stripping out things that are inappropriate for that type of analysis, can happen automatically because we understand uh, the data. So, uh, and, and this sort of story can go on. The more and more we connect tools together and take advantage of the knowledge that's been encoded by, um, by experts, or by people who are, um, you know, sort of working and, and, and focusing on particular aspects of the system, the uh, higher the value that the business gets from uh, gets gets from the work that people are doing. Now, and so this is the role of um, ODPI Ageria or just Ageria um, that, uh, that, that 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 we're focused on in this open source project. So it's it's all about enabling that flow of knowledge between people, processes, tools, engines, whatever, however you want to talk about them. And, and it's particularly important when a business wants to be agile, it needs to, to change the way it's working, it needs to um, uh, embrace new types of technology, uh, and it wants its um, staff to be as uh, sort of enabled as possible, particularly when it comes to data. So it's extremely important to businesses uh, in today's world. Now, if you've been around a long time, um, which uh, in this industry, which I have, you're probably going, but haven't there been a lot of attempts to do this type of uh, work in the past? And you'd be completely correct. Uh, we actually, this is such a, an important piece of capability that we have done lots of things over the years to try and make this happen. Um, but now we're at a point where um, open source is, is very widely accepted, it's widely deployed, and there's an awful lot of recognition that sort of core infrastructure should be open and shared and used across multiple vendors. And so we're at a perfect time to, to take this type of idea and through open source um, and open governance of that open source uh, project, move, uh, move the whole um, sort of process forward so that we can get to a point where uh, that ability to flow metadata between different tools is, uh, it, it becomes an industry standard. So what's different about Ageria is that we focus very much on being open, not just in the code itself and, and the way the code operates, uh, but in the way that we operate to make sure that many people have a say in how it's developing. Um, and, uh, and also to think about the fact that there are many ways and places and environments that we need this technology to work in. And that there may be multiple vendors involved of different sizes as well as the open source projects. So we need to make it fair. So it's not just enough that it, the technology is open, but the way we work is open and that the architecture allows um, it, it, you know, multiple participants to deliver value to the organization running the software. Um, the other thing is that it's a very big problem. And so as a team, we work in a very iterative uh, way, looking at the problem holistically, working through different use cases. Um, and uh, 
um, making sure that everything we do is very visible so that people can provide feedback at all stages of the design and development. And the result has been very positive in that uh, we have uh, managed to uh, create some, some quite interesting innovations in this space as we break down the traditional silos between different tools. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, a number of these uh, in the time that we have uh, left in this session. So the very first part of this is that um, we, we're not planning on creating a, a new mega database of metadata. Each of the tools continues to use their own metadata repository, but we provide the ability for them to exchange metadata in a peer-to-peer -peer way. And we recognize that this may be deployed into an environment where it, there's not a very large IT team that can sort of run this. So it's designed to be um, self-configuring um, and, uh, and allow each tool to deliver its maximum value while making up the difference between you know, any deficiencies that a particular tool may have in terms of its, its ability to work with metadata. Now, um, on a picture like that, it all looks very simple, but actually there's an awful lot of devil in the detail in that uh, different tools use support a different subset of information and there are huge mismatches in the granularity, the terminology used, the ability to uh, maintain and manage the integrity of the metadata as we exchange it. And of course, using different, uh, they're all using different technologies. So we need to make sure that, um, th that Ajiri is able to fill the gaps wherever is needed. Um, and so what we have is, We've built a, a common language for metadata. So these are the, the types of metadata that we need to exchange um, and the definition of the structures, the protocols to do that exchange, um, but also to provide a lot of the uh, sort of core middleware type implementation that makes it as easy as possible for a particular piece of technology to be integrated into the ecosystem, because we want to make this as easy as possible for a particular technology to be part of the bigger ecosystem. So if we looked at this from the outside, um, you would see that um, uh, it, it, Egeria is a sort of the blue, <laughs> the, blue, the blue cloud in the middle um, and it is providing linkage for each tool. So each tool connects into Egeria uh, through a connector um, and is able to send and receive metadata. And then Egeria takes what's coming and distributes it to the places that, that needs it. So for each tool, the effort is just one connector to translate in and out of the open metadata type system, uh, types and interfaces. Um, and then everything that they need um, is then brought to them by Egeria. Now it looks again, it looks nice on these, the, this, this simple picture, but the environment that it's going into is highly diverse. So we have, um, so, so, you know, you can imagine there'll be multiple, it will be technology running on multiple different types of clouds in uh, on-premise uh, um, data centers, right out into the internet of things, right, you know, right out into the environment. And all of these com software components are, and, uh, are exchanging data and uh, performing process on data in this distributed manner. So for Egeria to be successful, um, it needs to be where the data and the processing is. So Egeria in this picture is the orange. Um, and you can see we have pushed it to all of the key places and then where, it, where it's located, it actually communicates with itself. We also support the fact that um, nowadays businesses share data and they might not want to connect their, their metadata repositories and their tools together. So there's an import export uh, format for metadata to allow a business partner to share data and the metadata that goes with it, which could be the classifications, terms and conditions associated with the data, along with all those uh, vocabulary descriptions and things like that. So um, not only is there sort of a live exchange of metadata for within the organization, but also an import export to allow 
um, metadata to flow between business partners in a sort of disconnected um, mechanism. Here's another picture. So uh, here we're starting to show the fact that Yes, the Egeria is deployed into lots of different environments and that's represented by the green clouds and Egeria itself um, is uh, consists of a platform for hosting co the connectors. So each of the blue boxes in this picture shows the Egeria platform sitting in each of the, the different environments. And of course, the blue arrows show the fact that Egeria is doing the exchange between itself and the uh, sort of yellow and orangey arrows are the exchange between that the connectors are managing to the specific technologies that are being uh, that are being used. And, and I keep using the word connector and, and the base of Ageria is a connector framework that allows us to integrate our runtime into different platforms um, and also to allow connectors to third party technologies to be integrated into the um, into the Ageria servers. So that's how, that's how, we, how we basically plug things into Ageria. But also um, applications can use our connector framework to connect to different types of data resources or services with a um, additional method on there that allows them to access the metadata that's equivalent to the data or service that they're accessing. So applications can use metadata directly through the connector framework um, as opposed to um, having Ageria push metadata into the applications as needed. Now, from that picture, we talked about, you know, that there are these um, connectors and they run, uh, they run on the platform, but actually the connectors and the different types of connectors run in what we call a server. So a server is a configured um, sort of virtual runtime that sits on top of the platform. So a platform can support multiple servers at any one time. And there are different types of servers that perform uh, the support different types of connectors and perform a particular role in the ecosystem. In the center, we have um, the metadata repository. So there are tools that their job is to uh, maintain a, uh, a database of metadata. Uh, and maybe there are other governance services around it and catalog uh, search APIs, that sort of thing you'd expect with it. And so the first thing we need to do is to take those rich sources of metadata and get those to be exchanged between the, the, different, the different metadata repositories. And this is what we call the integrated metadata part of the solution. It's, it, it's the core um, of, of what's going on. Then there are lots of other tools that really they use metadata, but it's not their main job. So you think of um, uh, a, a sort of data processing engine, a database. The database, of course, has a lot of metadata and it has a schema in it, um, but its real job is storing data. So uh, we need to connect to and exchange metadata with all these tools that use metadata, um, but it's a simpler integration because, as I say, these, these see these tools treat metadata as a means to an end rather than their main job. So this is where the governance servers come in. Um, and what we're, what, what we're saying is that the, the central core is like the, the core not knowledge base for metadata. And then we need uh, to actively exchange metadata with the tools that are using it so that not only can we gather knowledge about the different resources that are being created, but we can push metadata out to configure those technologies so that they are operating in a consistent and compliant manner um, from, by using the metadata in, in, the, in this way. Finally, we need to bring people into the story. Um, and so we have the, the, uh, the sort of the view services that allow this, all of this integrated technology to be brought together into a solution. Um, and so these are services that are designed for uh, user interfaces and um, they're very much focused on enabling humans to be part of the, the bigger ecosystem. Although um, it, it's, it's important to remember that actually most of the user interfaces that people will deal with in this ecosystem actually come from the tools that are integrated through integrated governance. This is just another picture showing those different types of, uh, of servers and how they are uh, sort of grouped and um, organized in, in our internal architecture. 
Uh, and this picture here is talking about different deployment approaches between the servers and the platform. So, uh, as I said before, Jiri has to run in a wide variety of um, environments. So this core platform that, that is deployed in, in, into, into a particular environment can run on something as small as a Raspberry Pi, or it can be scaled across a large Kubernetes cluster. Um, allowing uh, sort of rolling updates and uh, high availability through that type of clustering. Uh, the platform itself allows multiple servers to run. So you could run all, all the different types of servers you need for your organization on a single platform, or it might be that your software is a service type vendor and you want to run a different server for each of your customers and they will sit as virtual um, services on the platform. Um, on, a, on a single platform or on this uh, sort of highly scalable Kubernetes style. So there's a lot of flexibility in the way that you can deploy the platform and as a result in the way that you can configure and set up the integration environment you need for your tools. Now let's start looking about how this, what's going on behind the scenes. Because we've talked about the fact that metadata is being exchanged and it's all um, sort of uh, all slightly different in each tool. So um, the very, that core piece I talked about, the integrated metadata, the exchange of metadata between metadata repositories that happens in that cohort. So that collection, that peer-to-peer -peer exchange uh, that uh, is at the heart of uh, Egeria's integration. And so different tools can connect into the cohort and they have then got uh, visibility, um, security allowing um, for all of the metadata in all of the peers or the members of the same cohort. And it's also possible, particularly where you have um, particular servers that are wanting to serve sort of in you know, multiple groups, you know, sort of a, a corporate level um, services, they can join multiple cohorts and then we'll see the superset of the metadata from the cohorts that they join. And what's happening under the covers is um, uh, the, the whole cohort is, co is configured um, uh, automatically. So here we've got um, a metadata server, server one in shown in pink, and it wants to join the cohort. So it puts a registration document into a Kafka topic, which we call the RMRS topic. Then um, here's a second server joining, server two, the blue server, um, and it puts its registration document uh, into the topic and they both receive the others and they have a, a negotiated exchange and um, what they're uh, exchanging is knowledge of the types of metadata they each support, uh, where they're located in the network so they can call one another um, and just making sure that they are um, compatible, compatible to exchange metadata. Once that's complete uh, they're able to then call one another so they can issue um, they can combine metadata from the other server and their own metadata. So here we see pink metadata appearing in server two and blue metadata appearing in server one. Um, and, and this, you might leave it at this, but you can also set it up so that in the background, certain types of metadata are replicated um, to create copies in different repositories. Uh, and this is useful to, to increase availability, or if you have a server that's not able to do federated queries and needs to have all the metadata it's offering to its users in its own database. So uh, Egeria will combine the use of federated or distributed queries uh, with the ability to do replication in the background. The way we store metadata is actually, um, we break it down into small uh, nuggets of, of, of information that is each owned by a single server. So we have the notion of entities, that's information about a thing, uh, relationships between entities, uh, showing how they're, they're tied together, um, and classifications, which are the way to actually augment a particular definition. So we can say, here's a definition of um, a credit card number, and we can add a classification to say this credit card number is sensitive. Or we could add a classification to say this credit card information has to be kept for seven years. So that's the role of the classification. And what's going on in the um, in, under the covers, so to speak, is um, that uh, we are shuffling stuff around so that we can link it together. So we might have, for example, here, we've got um, a description of a database column in one server 
and a um, description of a glossary term or a, a sort of a vocabulary definition in another. And we want to link them together. So it could be that we shuffled, went the wrong way. <laughs> uh, it could be that we shuffle the, um, the glossary term uh, into server one and connect it there. Um, or it might be that server one doesn't support glossary terms and server two doesn't support database columns, in which case we can bring in a third server into the cohort um, and make the connection there. And it actually doesn't matter which we do. Um, it, when we issue a query, we will get all three pieces back together as if they were stored in one repository. Um, and this means that we can augment the capabilities of the tools and engines that are uh, connecting to the cohort uh, with additional governance function um, that uh, none of them support because we are able to store that metadata in, uh, in a Nigeria repository. In looking at the needs of many companies uh, in terms of supporting the regulations and their needs for uh, di completely digital operation, uh, we've come up with um, a broad range of metadata that is um, uh, that uh, that is needed, and it's about 500 different types. Um, I'm sure over time this is going to grow, but this is our effective starter set, uh, and they link together. Um, to allow you to go from sort of re regulatory requirements through to specific implementations and the current state of those implementations, who's working with it and how it's being used in the organization. This also includes uh, lineage, which is uh, very important to many organizations. And that whole set of types um, can be exchanged across the cohort, but also we provide higher level interfaces to make it easier for different types of tools to connect into, in, into the ecosystem. Um, and here you can see these white boxes represent the different types of APIs that we have. And the name of them gives you an idea of the type of focus, the type of metadata that flows across those interfaces. And then we need to integrate with tools. This is the uh, governance service. Um, we need to integrate with tools that have different types of capabilities. So some might, like a database typically, um, you, we can call it and we can poll it and we can pull the schemas and monitor the changing schemas within it. Other types of technology create events when things change and we can listen for those events and use them. So we support a variety of um, different uh, integration patterns. And then they can be built up to allow us to not only automatically extract metadata from the different types of tools, but push metadata to other technologies to allow that technology to be configured for different types of scenarios. So here we're building um, views over data as it's captured and brought into a particular um, data lake uh, to allow um, the virtualization engine to act as an access point where additional security can be applied to the user to the calls from users of a, of a data lake. Um, there's also quite a focus on user interfaces in, uh, in Nigeria at the moment, particularly allowing people to connect to a repository and explore the content to look at the types that are supported in each server and how the servers are connected together in the in the ecosystem. Um, and um, the vendors that we're working with, we're working with uh, a lot of uh, household names when it comes to vendors, are looking at it um, from their own internal perspective, linking together different versions of their products or where multiple versions of their product are deployed across an enterprise or um, making uh, taking advantage of the integration with different technologies that Algeria provides um, or expanding the amount of metadata that they can access to. So there's, there's a huge range of opportunities that um, uh, that Nigeria can provide to a particular vendor and to open source projects um, in general. The way we operate is um, uh, we have um, a very modular architecture and we've been, which we've been working through building up increasingly um, uh, yeah, a more sophisticated APIs to enable the integration. And uh, as I said before, we're very open in terms of how we operate. So you'll see, if you look at our Git repository, there are some things that are released functions and other things that are actually uh, still in progress and at different levels of, of development. So uh, the way we work is each month we create a release 
and that has uh, whatever's ready uh, is, is then incorporated in the release. Um, and from here, you can see the green areas are the released and uh, sort of tech preview type um, uh, function. Orange means that there's active development work going on. Red means that it's, uh, uh, it's still in negotiation. So it's pretty much a, a paper exercise at this point as to what's in that particular function. Um, and um, uh, let's see what we got. To, oh yes, this, this picture here is just showing roughly where we're focused on, as you can see. Uh, good focus on integration, user interfaces, and looking at expanding the capability, the ability to capture uh, lineage and those controlled vocabularies. So um, what do we get from Egeria? Egeria is a open source distributed um, ability to connect together different tools and allow an organization to be far more agile and um, build and share knowledge uh, far more effectively, even though they use tools from lots of different vendors and open source projects. So thank you so much for listening um, and uh, I will hand over to the next talk.